Welcome everybody to uh, our first Division of Biostatistics seminar for this uh, academic school year. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Daniel Diaz as our uh, speaker today. So I'll get all of you know who he is or have no idea who he is, but uh, we're videotaping this, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so Daniel got his uh, bachelor's degree at, in Columbia at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Um, and he was working in, I guess, in uh, experimental designs and, and statistics and, and there. Uh, he then moved to the Institute of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Sao Paulo, and he did his PhD in probability theory uh, with a heavy dose of statistics as well there. Um, since, I think, about 2011, he's been here as a postdoctoral research fellow, uh, working primarily with myself and, and with uh, Dr. Ishwin as well. Um, he's got a very uh, array of research interests, um, some of which would sound kind of interesting. So he, he, he works on uh, one area that he calls disordered systems, um, and it's, a, it's the, the basis of his uh, thesis work. Um, I'll tell you a little, just a, a one-line thing, and then I'll give you an application area, because sometimes these are hard to put into context if you're not from this world. But uh, he worked on a model called the uh, Stable Marriage of Poisson Bay, and that was his, his dissertation work. And uh, he used, uh, in these models, he used percolation properties, large deviations, large dimensions. Um, and you can think of an application area as uh, this is something like you want to watch how disease spreads in a population and predict how fast it spread. You can use some of these, these concepts. <coughs> um, the work that we will be presenting today encompasses uh, some work in high dimensional data analysis. I won't, I won't get into too much of that today. We'll talk about that. He's also done some work on target search and no free lunch uh, theorems. Um, and uh, again, this is from sort of information theory and, and uh, probability theory. And the implications here, are, I guess, are really in evolutionary algorithms. Um, and then he's also done some work in experimental designs. So most of us heard of split plot designs. He's done some work in strip split plot designs. Um, reworking a lot of the, uh, the inference and estimation for those models. Um, and he's just barely started to think about some applications of design to medical problems like uh, medical nanotechnology might be areas for that. So today, he's got, a sh I guess, a shortened title of his talk here, but it's um, Principal Components Analysis and something called Patient Rule Induction Method, or what we call bump funds and statistics. So, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's the first time I'm here in front of the division, so it's nice to be here. Um, yep, I'm going to talk about principal components, mainly about a result we found after two years and a half of working with Dr. Rowe and a colleague in Case Western Reserve, John L. Desart. So let's uh, start. To set the stage, uh, let us think of a context of uh, response and a, uh, predictor set. And let us assume W is a p-dimensional continuous random vector on RP. And assume that uh, W has multivariate distribution F is centered around the origin, his expectation is uh, zero, and has finite variance. The requirement of finite variance will be, well, because it's needed to do principal components, and because, and the requirement of the expectation zero is also needed in some point because we are working with cosines and uh, correlation functions which are correlated. And let's see, be a continuous random variable unidimensional, but living in the uh, p-dimensional Euclidean space we are considering from the beginning. <coughs> Let us consider also uh, supports or projections to, from the p-dimensional space to the unidimensional space, Euclidean p-dimensional space to the Euclidean unidimensional space. And let us assume that all the projections we are taking, all the supports we are taking, unidimensional supports, are traversing the origin. I will show some graphics 
uh, below. <coughs> so all these projections of the p-dimensional Euclidean space on the unidimensional Euclidean space crossing the origin, in fact, are at the supports of the univariate, or univariate versions of the p-variate distribution we are considering at the beginning. For instance, if we do the rotations to the principal components in space, considering all the p variables, then the axes are going to be the supports of the principal components of the random variables then that we are considering. And call the space of all the unidimensional projections omega. All, I mean, all the space in the p-dimensional Euclidean space traversing the origin, that space is called omega. Now, we can select deterministically from omega a set of p orthogonal rays or supports. Let's call it S1 to sp, crossing the origin of the Euclidean space in p dimensions. So these rays are going to be the supports of uh, p random variables orthogonal. Not necessarily, we are not thinking here about uh, principal components, they can be any set of orthogonal random variables in the p-dimensional space. <coughs> and of course, those p-dimension, uh, those p-random variables are going to be also projections, as, we, as I said before, of the p-dimensional distribution. Now, from that same set omega, we're going to select p plus one rays to be the supports of uh, the random variable z that is the response we are looking for, or yeah, the response we are studying, and some other p variables, <coughs> uh, any variables and any projections that are living on that projection of the of the p-dimensional space, and we are going to consider the angles. Here, all the magic and all the magic that I'm going to talk about is done by the angles. So theta sub i is going to be the angle between the response and each of the uh, orthogonal random variables I'm considering, and psi sub i will be the minimal angle also between the supports of z and xi, which are the origin, the, we can think of those as the input space we are considering from the beginning. Now, a little note here, this is not only the minimal angle, but the absolute minimal angle, so we are considering the positive uh, angle. And let us consider some event EZ, just as the support is located in an orthon. An orthon is a hyperoctant or a quadrant in two dimensions, in two dimensions and a octant in three dimensions, and an orthon from that point on. And define analogously S sub, E sub X1 to E sub XP. So E sub C is the event that. Uh, the uh, support is located in one of the hyperoctants. And without loss of generality, let us assume that Z particularly is living in the first hyperoctant. The first hyperoctant, as I'm calling here, as you can think of, is the octant in which everything is positive. So for instance, in two dimensions, sorry, <coughs> I have my perpendicular uh, supports and I have that then, if I'm in the first orthon, the expectation of the first variable I'm taking is in the middle, the point in which uh, will be on the vector 1, 1. <coughs> now, with that, I have the expectation of the cosine of the angle theta, that is the angle between the response and the perpendicular random variables, is uh, p to the one mi uh, to the one to the minus one half. That is in two dimensions. We will have here that is the square root one over the square root of two, which is intuitively clear to see. And uh, this is true for all dimensions. And we have also that conditioning on the position of z and the uh, input variable i. The cosine of the angle is going to be 1 minus 2 j p to the minus 1, where j is the number of minus signs that are on the hyperoctant in which uh, z is living. For instance, if z 
is in the hyperoctan minus plus, then j is, j is 1 in this case in two dimensions. So p is 2 and j is 1. <coughs> so what we are going to do is conditioning on the, on the hyperoctans or the orthans in which uh, every variable is living, we're going to have that all those variables in expectation are in the middle of that hyperoctant. And with that, we have that we only need to count the number of minus signs to be able to calculate the uh, cosine of the, of the angle between the two supports. <coughs> so doing that then, I have that condition, conditioning on those two events, E z and e, e sub x i, the cosine of the angle is 1 minus 2 j to, to times p to the minus 1, with j being larger than 0 but less than p halves. And that is because I don't need to consider the whole space when I'm considering the minus sign because I'm having the following situation here. <coughs> when I'm considering, for instance, that I'm living in the plus plus, that my x is living in the plus plus uh, orthant, then I'm also having that the variable is living in the minus minus. So it's the times minus 1 is also, if my variable is living in the first orthant, it's also living in the orthant times minus 1. So I need only consider half of the space to see this. If it, if it is living here, then it is living here too. <coughs> then I have that the difference between these two cosines, conditional on, tho on, that, on those two events, is, well, I'm taking just the difference. And I have that uh, this difference is going to be larger than 0, bigger than 0, for that value of p star, I mean, for any j between p star and p halves on the uh, integral part of p halves. The integral part because, well, when I have a number of dimensions that is odd, then it's not going to be an integral. So let us consider two events. The event g plus is the event that the difference of the cosines of those two angles is larger than zero, larger than zero, and the event g minus that the difference of the cosines of those two angles is less than zero. <coughs> With that, <coughs> uh, with that setting, we can prove the following theorem that the expectation of the uh, oh. I forgot always the name of the one. The expectation of 1g plus minus 1g minus given Ez is this thing when p is even, uh, no sorry, this thing with p is odd and this thing with p is even plus a uh, little old function 1. Um, with this, when I do the calculation for this, and I'm not showing the exact proof of this, when I'm doing the calculation for this thing, what I get is that the difference is larger than zero for all p, and that the sequence, this sequence here, is diverging. The first part, what it's telling me, actually, is that the principal components, or any set of orthogonal random variables, are explaining better the space in probability than the original random variables. It is in probability. In fact, this can be converted to probability here. And uh, we can eliminate the, uh, the condition. Now, the zero one, the, the little old one, sorry, is just because we can have the situation in P, when P is large, that two uh, of the uh, input random variables are living in the same hyperoctant. And when they are living in the same, in the same hyperoctant, well, that's going, to be, that's going to happen, and that's going to occur with a probability of uh, little one. Actually, it's much, much smaller. It's almost uh, exponential, but little one will surface. So <coughs> take, taking this into account, Coming back here, what we're getting then is that this sum is positive 
for values of j between p star and p halves. So <coughs> when we convert this to the number of hyperoctants, sorry, to the number of hyperoctants in which they can live to be almost orthogonal, what we're looking at is that uh, in situations in large dimensions when the uh, z's and the z and x and the x's are almost orthogonal or orthogonal. It's going to happen if you think about it in, the t in terms of the um, Pascal triangle in the terms that are, that are almost in the middle of the Pascal triangle which are the terms we are considering in the first uh, in the left side of the sum. In the subtraction we are considering the terms which are uh, closer to, the, to that hyperoctant and that's a situation which is happening a lot in uh, large dimensions. So these are, the, these are the terms that are closer to the, to the z, to the hyperoctants that are closer to the z, and these are the cases in which uh, the hyperoctants are on the other extreme of z. So what we need to see is that this difference of the hyperoctants, which are uh, almost orthogonal, are larger than the, than the ones that are closer to to the orton in which uh, the response is living. And we are getting that. So when we convert it to probability, what we are having is that the difference of the two probabilities of the event g plus minus g minus uh, is always larger than zero. And this difference starts increasing, not monotonically, but it's going to one. <coughs> So this is the case, for instance, in which, as, as I was telling you, in, in two dimensions, in which two uh, inputs are living in the same in the same quadrant. In this case, in the dimension two. So what we are getting is a stochastic result, not deterministic. It could be the case, it could be, or we can have the case that the response, which is the green line, is living between, in this case, for instance, between the two uh, input variables. So in, the, in this case, the input variables are explaining better the response than the uh, orthogonal variables. However, in probability, even in dimension two, we have that z is going to be better explained by the principal components. For instance, in this case, as I was showing in this case here. In this case, the response is being better explained by the uh, orth uh, orthogonal random variables. There are more cases and it can be shown that the probability in dimension two is of the orthogonal random variables explaining better the response than the input variables is bigger than one half. <coughs> can, you, can you define G again please? Yes. G is the difference of the cosines. The cosine of the angle uh, theta which is the angle between the response and the orthogonal random variables, each of the orthogonal random variables, but it's not with a uh, sub-index because we are, taking the, we are taking it conditional to being in the middle. So it's going to be the same angle here and the same angle here and the same in, in a, for every orthogonal random variable. In this case, the angle here is going to be uh, pi halves, pi fourths, sorry, and here is going to be pi fourths too. So if I have, uh, if I'm putting always in expectation dx in one of the orthans, conditional to being in one of the orthans, I'm going to read that it's in the middle and the expectation of the cosine with respect to every uh, orthogonal random variable, support of the random variable is going to be the same. So g plus is the cosine of the response of the angle between the response and the uh, orthogonal random variables, and the cosine of psi is the angle. Psi is the angle between the response and the uh, original input variables. Okay, so okay. The, the interpretation in terms of principal components is that if you have x variables which are correlated, um, that presents a problem when you're doing regression. So what you could do is create these orthogonal vectors and use that to predict y. And, and you're saying that that's a better thing to do because they are 
um, somehow closer in this coast state and coast fly distance to the response? Uh, yep. Yep, yep, yep. That's exactly. Uh, I mean, even if they are, uh, even if your original random variables are uh, not correlated, then what you're getting is that any set of principal components is explaining the probability of that set of uncorrelated random variables with respect to principal component set or any other set of uh, uh, orthogonal random variables. They are explaining the same thing. It's never the case that in probability, the probability that uh, the original input variables are explaining better the response is greater than one half. It's bigger than one half. What are the conditions that, um, that you, you require for this result? The I know you said this, but just to, to remind me. The conditions. On the beginning, I just required that uh, <coughs> it has a finite second moment for the um, original input variables. And well, I'm conditioning on the fact that each uh, support is living in one of the hyperoctants, which I can get rid of easily because I have always two to the p hyperoctants. So the only thing that I need to get rid of that thing is to uh, multiply by two to the p. That's here. So here, since the expectation of these uh, things is a probability, because these are Bernoulli random variables, I'm dividing by the two to the p cases I'm considering. And since uh, I'm only considering half of the space because I don't need more than that, then I have that this is two to the one minus p. So g plus is, how does g plus relate to g? g plus is, uh, This plus is directly correlated, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're just taking those things. No, no, no problem. You're just taking those things and seeing from that point, what we are doing is to add half of the uh, Pascal triangle. So that's why, I mean, yeah. That's what I'm doing here. I'm considering the points from P star to P halves. And then I'm considering the points from P1 to P star minus 1, which is like uh, looking at the combinations of the possible octants or hyperoctants, which are uh, closer or farther from, for the uh, Z. OK? So this is the main result that we are getting, that this difference is increasing to 1 almost surely. And that difference is always positive. And this result follows from the other because it's expectation of boundary Yeah, 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 yeah. So the only thing I'm doing is, as I'm saying, to, to eliminate the condition is to consider the fact that we have two to the p uh, hyperoctants. <coughs> so all, actually all the magic is yeah, on the condition. On the condition we are imposing here on the on EZ. That Z is living in the, in the hyperoctant, in a given hyperoctant. And you have to use all of the, um, the orthonormal uh, vectors, correct, for this result? Yes, I have you to. You can't exclude any of them. No, I'm not, I'm not excluding those. Um, because there are classical examples where we do that. Yes. No, we are not doing that. Right. In fact, I'm mentioning that uh, below. But uh, we are not doing that. But there is this important thing also that when you have a large P, all principal components or all orthogonal <coughs> random variables in general are going to explain better or with high probability, with really high, high probability, are going to explain uh, the response better than the original input variables. And that is because if you have uh, P dimensions, you have two to the P hyperoctants but only p supports of the random variables. So the uh, quotient is p to the p over 2 to the p. This is really slow. So I mean, it's really slow for p. And it's really fast for the principal components. <clears throat> so in the principal components, what you're getting is that it is increasing exponentially fast 
the speed with which you can uh, explain the response with principal components. So, <clears throat> again, that's, the point. that's what you were asking. So, PC is a particular case of any set of orthogonal random variables. And we are not reducing the space. Heidi and Ling, for instance, have a paper in 1998 in uh, American Statistician showing that there are problems with you when you are reducing the space because the response can be highly correlated to the, to the one of the last principal components you're taking and, or you're removing from the space. So we are not doing that. But even if we are doing that, we have no problem with the, when the dimension is large because almost all the dimensions, oh, sorry, almost every P is going to be explaining better the response than, than the original input variables. Also, we are not playing with the variance except to ensure that the principal component exists. The principal components exist. Now, regarding to this point, uh, Bing Li and RTMU proved in a uh, all they published in 2009 in Statistica Sinica that uh, when you have a set of principal components, the principal components, the main principal components are explaining better the response than the last principal components in probability again. This is not deterministic. This is not deterministically. This is pro in probability. So the first principal component, for instance, is, is, has higher probability of explaining better the response than the second, and the third, and the fourth, and so on. And they are using the fact of the variance and the, the variance covariance structure. We are not using that. We are just taking the geometry of the orthogon and the orthogonality. That's what we are using in this result. Now, what's the motivation to do this? The motivation is a colon cancer example in way with which uh, Sunil Rao and John Dassart were working before. In the colon cancer examples, we have that there are stages of cancer, and uh, some of those uh, stages are metastatic. And we, well, what they observed is that they could find some subgroups between each of those stages in which the survival was different, even inside those stages. So the main thing, that the reason for us to start thinking on all this problem was because they needed to find subgroups. And for, uh, to do that, they, re, uh, they start using this uh, PRIM algorithm. PRIM stands for patient role induction method. And we needed to be able to compare two uh, situations of PRIM. So in PRIM, let us again think of x as a continuous p-dimensional random vector with distribution f. And let z be a continuous random variable. And what we are looking to explain here is the expectation, the conditional expectation of the response given uh, the predictors. And then let us assume without loss of generality that the function m is not negative. So what we are interested is in that function i of c, where i is an integral in terms of the integral of m in terms of the distribution. So we are taking the average of that function in a region z, and what we are interested in looking, what we are looking at is that the average on that region c is larger than the average on the whole space. Larger than the average on the whole space. <coughs> so Prim has two stages, peeling and coring. Actually, it has three, but I'm explaining here only two. And uh, the two that I'm taking here can be taken as a lower bound on optimality for those two, for those three regions considered completely. Now, Prim works like that. Let us assume that we have our uh, space and we have our response. What it's doing, Prim, is uh, peeling from each side of the space we are considering of the beginning. And the way that it peels is that it's going to start peeling on each side such that the function m and that part peeled is uh, lower than in, than, in any, than in any of the other sides. So I'm going sequentially doing that until I find a little box which 
with a support that I defined from the beginning. In this case, it, this is the box, and let us call that support beta. And once I, fi once I find that uh, region, that's a square region beta, I'm going to remove that region, and I'm going to repeat the process, say, t times. That repetition of the process t times is called the coverage stage. So Prim is doing from one single uh, stage of covering, and then repeating the process t times, removing the box that I found in each of the uh, peeling stages. At the end, what I'm doing is uh, taking the union of all those little boxes that I moved, and that's the region I was looking for specifically and mathematically, is this R rho P uh, set. It's the union of some, of some boxes, the, of the boxes that we found through peeling, repeating the peeling stage t times. So this is, for instance, for instance, how prim in the input space looks after 20, inter uh, 20 interactions. Oops, this falls. Uh, after 20 iterations of the uh, algorithm. In the input space, it looks like that. Now, we can do that prim in the principal components space. And it looks like that. So it's, in some sense, a neater version or vision of the data we are considering. So doing that, what we wanted to do was to compare what was happening between the original input space and the principal component space. The only problem is that, as you see here, the, the boxes that we are finding here are not centralized. This is, each box is found removing uh, every po uh, portions of the, uh, on the sides. So maybe they can be nearly centralized, but not centralized at all in the end. So uh, we need to be able to compare that. So we develop a modification of the algorithm that allows us to have this centralized version of the boxes in order to compare them. So what we did is the following. We consider a super idealized case of normality and uh, of standard normality indeed. In the case of a standard normality, we have that the inputs, that the input vector is a normal standard vector, and the response is also a normal, random, a normal standard random variable. So the modification goes like this. We make two p pills at the same time. So we are removing from each side at the same time. And we are removing the same portion in each, on each of the sides in probability. Since uh, the normal standard is spherical, what we are getting is squared boxes on the end. Squared boxes in which if I'm removing alpha in total, then each portion in, on each side I'm removing alpha times 2 times p to the minus 1. Then after L steps, the remaining box has the same beta measure and its center around the origin and have marginals uh, beta to the 1 over p. So at the end, in covering, what I'm doing again is uh, putting all those boxes together, putting the union of all those boxes. So with this modification, the final box at the end of the algorithm is going to be centered. And it's also squared. It's not only centered, but it's a squared in the sense that all the marginals have the same volume, I mean, the same uh, Lebesgue measure, and the same probability measure. So if I have that, then the whole algorithm can be reduced to select the central box. And that's basically, basically what is said here. We, we can state that as a theorem here. When the, uh, in this super idealized case, when the all th everything is normal, is st standard normal, we have that the whole algorithm can be implemented in a single step of finding a centralized box, considering the number of repetitions that I'm doing my peeling process and the size of the, of the final box beta. <coughs> 
when I remove the condition of being a standard, but again, um, keeping the normality, what, I, what I'm getting is that the final box is going to be rectangular, not uh, square necessarily. However, uh, in this case, not all the variables have the same variance. So we can be in a not situation in which we are reducing, in which we are peeling something that we do not want to peel because in the end, if you remember, the function m is about maximi is the, f the whole algorithm is about the maximization of the function m. But and the m is unexpected. Uh, it's a conditional expectation. So we can be doing that. We can be in the situation in which we are peeling some things that we don't want to peel. So the solution to do that in this case is implement principal components, reducing the space, considering only the principal components, the main, princi the main principal components, and then after doing prim on those principal components, taking all that we removed and pasting it, I mean, all the dimensions we removed and pasting it on the, on the algorithm. With that, then we have that uh, a theorem also for fast prim, as we call this modification. And this is assuming that the response is normal and that the uh, input is normal. The whole algorithm can be reduced to a single stage also of finding uh, the central box, which is not a square, but is rectangular and is again centralized around the origin. So this is like fast prim looks in the input space, assuming this, this, is, this data is uh, generated from a bivariate normal distribution. And this is how prim will look in the principal components space just for one single repetition of the coding stage. I mean, just for one single stage of pasting. However, when we increase the number of repetitions of this peeling, we see that we are not getting too much, even with this super idealized version of the algorithm. In these simulations, for instance, we are considering the, the speed of computation for, in the superior case, uh, prim in the input space and prim in the PCA space. <coughs> and below we are considering the speed of computation for fast prim in the input space and fast prim in the PCA, uh, in the PCA space. So what we are getting finally here, look, the red lines are showing the, the time of computation for prim in the input space and the green lines are showing for prim in the PCA space. So compare this when the dimension starts growing, sorry, when the number of repetitions starts growing, t in this case, and the dimension also, we have that it's almost the same considering prim in the principal components space and fast prim in the principal components space. It's doing almost the same thing and it's working almost the same. So all the effect, all we were gaining, all we were getting with the with the idealized version of the algorithm for, lower num for a lower number of repetitions, for a lower number of dimensions, is being lost when the dimension increases and when the number of repetitions of the algorithm increases. <coughs> Again, here we have some comparisons that are showing also the same thing, but in this case we are considering uh, the output mean standardized by the size of the volume, by the volume of the, of the box, sorry, by the, the, uh, the output mean is standardized by the volume of the box we are considering. And even though we are looking that in small stages, fast prime again is doing better for a higher number of repetitions, for high, high number of repetitions of, of fast prime, it's working almost the same. Indeed, those finals uh, graphs look almost the same for fast prim and for prim in the PC, the comparisons for PC in the, uh, in the input space, sorry, the comparison for prim in the input space and the comparison for the principal components space. So if you see here, what is happening in the, in the, with prim and here what is happening with the fast prim, we're getting almost the same. So 
the magic is not being done by the algorithm. The magic is done in all these cases by the principal components. So as an example, this is what we were getting with the result that we found and that I explained in the first part. So I don't know if there are some questions. <laughs>